Welcome to Speak, a platform where artisans can talk about their work in the arts and also share their opinions on some of the largest industries in the creative industry today. My name is Jennifer DeMarco. I'm a novelist, filmmaker, poet, playwright, and core mechanic designer for gaming systems, in addition to being a musician. And today I am speaking with David Mecklenburg, the author and illustrator, the creator of the Ada's World books. Hi, David, and welcome to speak. When you introduce yourself, do you usually say the author of, or do you say author and artist or author and illustrator of? Author and uh, illustrator. Author and illustrator. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the illustrations always come second. Usually, well, I discuss that later, but usually <laughs> when I was beginning, the illustrations always came separately, as oh. they usually do when um, you have a book and you give it to an illustrator, you know, yeah. somebody will say, right. here you go. Yes. Um, and certainly I started off that way, but mm -hmm. um, the most latest book, Deo Collectrum, does not work that way. Mm -hmm. There were several images I had in my mind that I drew beforehand that were then have exegetic stories like brought to them before you had done any of the writing for the book at all or uh, no no as i was kind of moving through it an, an image would come up uh -huh. there was one particular one i knew of of uh, nausicaa discovering odysseus yeah and i couldn't figure out what that was until finally this sort of other story that was not really involved with the odyssey at mm -hmm. all came forward and i realized like oh that's the, that's the story that goes with this picture so yeah. it's this ekphrastic process yeah where you draw something and you think oh i need to do this mm -hmm. well, I've, i have this image in my head and there's a story that has to go with it yeah. so which i think a lot of writers do um it's just i get the benefit of being able to actually draw it first right and then be able to fit the story and since these are very short essay mm -hmm prose essay, kind of prose poetry essays, they were easy to do that way. Your editor, Brianne DeMarco at Blue Forge Press, one of the things that she talked to me about before I came to interview today is she said, one of the things about, and I'm sorry if I slaughter it, is it Deo Collectrum? Yeah. Okay, yes, all right. Um, with Deo Collectrum is that even though people might be a little intimidated by the size, I mean, it's quite a tome, the pieces are very accessible. Because right. it isn't something where, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to put this down. Well, actually, I do find it difficult to put down, but not for the reason of, you know, I'm going to lose my, I'm going to lose where I am in the story. I'm not going to be able to hold all these characters in my head. They are almost like, have you ever watched a cooking show where they talk about the perfect bite? Um, yeah, I know of it, yeah. Yeah, so it's like you're almost composing for, it's a one bite perfect composition. And in... Deo Collectrum, I feel like that's what you did. You had these perfect bites that, at least to me as a reader, it felt like you wanted to share. With your other work, do you approach it in a perfect bite way? Um, no. Because you also range extremely in length. And I talked about this in another interview where some writers almost write to a pattern, to like um, a beat. And they'll turn in manuscript after manuscript, and they're all like 258 words long. Right. And you have ones here that are under 100, and you have ones here that are pushing 500. Yeah, pushing 500 or oh, over. Oh, for those over, for over on yeah. some of them, yeah. So talk to me about that process a little that bit. That process, um, well, it, it kind of goes to where it originally, the original source of where the book came from. Yeah was a small calendar mm -hmm. um and if you want um more there's more of the story on my website okay. you can read it to www.davidmecklenburg.com basically it was a small calendar i wanted to do like a zine yeah where it would be a small one page essay then a blank calendar mm -hmm. that way i never had to like throw them away because the people would actually fill in the dates themselves oh okay sure and then maybe an illustration or something so mm -hmm. every day you would look at something like this and say oh here's a little piece about january here's a yeah. little piece about february those actually show up in there they're still in there as to what they were yeah and they were all short so they all had to be within one page so all about 250 words and i kind of set my limit at that okay well, then there were some other pieces that I thought were good that were off of an old blog that I had originally done 
in support of some of the other books. And Deo Collectrum itself, the, the secret behind the name, yeah, it's a made-up Greek word for copy and paste, because okay. that's what I was doing. Okay. I would start by copying and pasting from a blog excerpt and putting it into this new format. And that's, I think, why they're easy to bite at first. Okay. That, that set the form. Yeah. <clears throat> but there was only about a third of it that was actually done that way. The other two thirds was written originally yeah. once I started going with that process. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I, I even could kind of see where the arc was going in it and how all of these very different strands of it fit together. Yeah, because it doesn't feel despair. It doesn't feel, they feel very connected. I thought the word had something to do with collection. Collection. It's you know? a friend of mine, uh, he calls Deo, reminds him of a collection of gods. Oh, and, um, oh, sure. I yes. said that's perfectly acceptable as yeah. well. Um, it does because there are gods that show up in that book a lot. Yeah. And once I got, once I kind of got the first uh, collection of it together, I realized that this was something different. It was, it was in part essay, these little essays, but of course they're not written by me. They're written yeah. by a fictional um, speaker. Mm -hmm. Which we'll get to. Which we'll get yeah. to. And then it, it there was a distinct arc that went through it from mm -hmm. a period of, um, and I knew this is how I had to organize it, of unrest and my life is changing to then the point where, well, how did I get here? And then the final third of it is resolution and t kind of tying up the loose ends. Okay. Um, feeling a sense of forgiveness towards some people or redemption, kind of finding... Uh, finding out the roots and things, and then being able to move on after that mm -hmm. in the cycle of life as it continues. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I realized it had all of that arc. And what really funny tied it together were um, Chopin's Nocturnes. There's 21 of them, and there's 21 of the Nocturne pieces that I thought of that form the bridge that go. Now, they're not exact. I didn't sit down and say, I'm going to write this story in B flat minor. Really nice. yeah. um, <laughs> but I was, I was listening to the Nocturne when I was writing them. So oh, okay. yes, there was definitely like, okay, I'm going to try, try to have this mood for this particular piece. And um, those eventually turned into the longer journey where she starts off, the character starts off listening to the two mothers speaking and eventually goes to meet, meets Mark Twain, meets Angela Carter, meets mm -hmm. Borges, mm -hmm. and travels through this kind of, uh, it's the, kind of the longest narrative strand that runs through it, until she finally gets to meet um, Louise Brooks. Mm -hmm. And um, that was where, well, that was how that, and everything else then I realized could just hang off of it. Yeah. I, I think that, I love this idea of art, music, and prose coming together in, and actually, I don't think, I don't know if you and I, I don't think you and I have ever talked about that. I didn't actually know that music had such a major play in the actual um, shaping of Deo mm, yeah. And I think that is very, so before we go any further, I know we've already kind of cracked open the Pandora's box that is Ada's world, but let's, we'll back up a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry, because it was, it really struck me because I have, I just interviewed an author that again, with all their books are very, very set in length. And I'm just looking at them on the shelf so precariously going, David does not uh, subscribe to that approach. These are not following the same formula or the same pattern. They really are their own entities. And I think that's interesting. But so before we dive completely into Ada's world, what do you want people to know first and foremost about you and your work? Like David Mecklenburg 101. It's, there's, it doesn't hold to any one single genre. Um, that to me is very important. And when I can say genre, I can say that in a very broad way of saying, not a lot of people may think genre is where you find books in a bookstore, mm -hmm. science fiction, YA, et cetera. It's over here and over here and over here. Um, there's also the idea of genre being, is it poetry? Is it nonfiction? Is it, is mm -hmm. it play? Is it a play? Is it a novel? And I try not to stick, although stri strict playwriting and screenwriting, I don't, I, I haven't really tried to tackle. So yeah. I won't say that's in there, but it does uh, piece a lot of this together. And I would say one of the things about the length of it is, uh, the other funny thing I remember as growing up as a kid is uh, we used to have this thing called Book of Lists. 
This mm-hmm. was pre-internet, folks. Uh, we had <laughs> the this internet is the book of lists. Book of lists yeah. now, <laughs> and uh, they were published by the Wallachinsky uh, family, and they had all of these like random things in there about like twelve composers who went deaf or died by the Ninth Symphony, and they had some other just odds and facts and okay. things like that. And it was always entertaining to read. You could read one piece of it, close it up, put it down, and move on. And yeah, I, I kind of thought of of some of the pieces as being like that. And so that was one of the other guiding um, stories behind that. But so that's to say is most of the stuff I think I try to write a little bit of everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. In Across the Desert of My Ghosts, those stories range all over the place. And Across the Deserts of My Ghosts, that is actually David's uh, collected short stories that he wrote for the Trinity Project, which we've also talked about on Speak before. And so that's, yes. And those, I was deliberately not trying to stick with a single style in that. Yeah. So there was one piece that I particularly liked where uh, the main character goes down with a friend of hers to visit um, Los Angeles. It's a very mm-hmm. realistic story. There's nothing weird that happens in it. And others that can go off into kind of uh, more magical realist place. Mm-hmm. Certainly the final story, that happened after binge watching a lot of David Lynch during um, <laughs> the pandemic. So there was a lot of that that was kind of floating around. Mm-hmm. Not so much the the not so much the actual stories. It's more of Lynch's technique is where you just kind of back off and let your subconscious yes. come up with images and you don't force them into things. No. You sort of just let them develop and these creates these these, you know, I've, I've even heard him use the same Bob Ross term of happy accidents. Yes. Uh, which is always interesting with him because they're usually these horrendous images, mm-hmm. but he still will call them these yeah. beautiful. Um, and that's what happened with that story. Whereas others, I've also tried just to write um, with, there's one in there called Cantata, mm-hmm. which was very formal, formulaic mm-hmm. because I had to look at a Cantata form mm-hmm. and because the main character is reading, she's in Leipzig where Bach taught yeah. and so she's looking at a cantata that he wrote in the Bach Museum yeah. and the rest of the stories start coming from so they had to be in the different voice polyphony voices that you see in a cantata and so the only thing I thought of was like I'll have all genres in that so there mm. is a genre about AI an mm-hmm. AI mm-hmm. that is building a perfect piano player yeah. there is a um, kind of a steampunk adventure story in that one and then there's the story of the person herself Who's kind of feeling the, uh, kind of feeling some, uh, at least a September May, romance feelings towards this young German uh, cello student. Mm-hmm. So those are all, and they all intermixed. But I had to be very careful about how I did that and write it. And each one of them wound up being the length they needed to. Mm-hmm. So I found that was another interesting piece that they just mm-hmm. got to a point you know where to stop. Yeah. It's like, no, it doesn't need to go. Anywhere. But on some level, that yeah. that part was set. That's a, that, that was set. But that's to kind of get around back to the original question. I tried to tried to write a story in there for everybody. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the stuff is, even th- something like Hyperborea, even if you don't want to read it, it's pretty to look at. It you is know? beautiful. And that's a, it is those very are color beautiful. images in that. Mm-hmm. That's taken from the old from the old Japanese woodcut tradition where they would present mm-hmm. 33 views of Mount, of Mount Fuji or 33 views along the way from Kyoto to Edo. Mm-hmm. And there would be a little poem here and there along each one of those pages. But most of them are just nice images to look at. And that was kind of the idea for that. So for Across the Deserts of My Ghosts, do you, what you're saying is you kind of, or tell me if this is what you're saying, that it is kind of an, an introduction to the world. Is it a gateway drug, David? Just be honest. You is can. this the gateway? It's, it is. I would say, actually, the thing is, if you're going to read the books, these two books actually should be read together because oh. they were written at the same time. Um, during the Trinity Project, um, we would get, as you know, a quote every month. And yeah. while I was working on the quote, I would write out the story that would eventually wind up being in across the desert at the same time, I'm also writing the Washington State Ferries to my day job, and I'm writing Deo Collectrum pieces. Mm-hmm. And so there are certain pieces, especially if you want to learn about, if you want to learn the real deep details of Ada's relationship with Astrid, you, you kind of have to read both of them because they're both in there. Um, 
uh, there's a lot of things that allude to it, for example, where she'll allude to things that happened in the Yucatan in Deo Collectrum. Well, the actual story of what happened in the Yucatan is in Across the Desert should, of My Ghost. Should read now. See, now you have me fascinated because I'm like, this one I've read, this one I've read in, but now I'm like, now wait a minute. Would you would you recommend first and second, or would you recommend reading them in tandem the way you wrote them? Uh, they could be read because they're not they're not straight right. narratives. You can read them in tandem, and you can I think you can also bounce around because while this was written with a, a story of oh, in tandem, uh, but they don't have to be chronological. They don't have to be gotcha. chronological, mm-hmm. and I think with uh, across the desert of my ghost because that was it while it was written every month Mm -hmm. the prompts that were sent out certainly weren't seasonal like here's your january prompt and it's going to be about cold and here's the summer prompt that's true i haven't so you don't really have to read them in terms like oh i want to read a june story well the june story in across the desert my ghost is ada's writing process yeah of how she writes and um then the previous one is is in may and it's said about um the camera Mm-hmm. And called the camera does not lie, and that's the big story about her and, and Astrid going mm-hmm. down to the Yucatan together. And so, you don't, yeah, you don't. You could kind of look at one of them and think, oh, that's kind of long. I'll just start with this one. I've got some time on my hands. I'll read an American in Ballard because that's a longer story. I'm completely off my framework of the questions I'm supposed to be asking, David. So forgive me, but I mean that to me is fascinating. That idea of one reading books in the way they were written in tandem and also being able to jump around like that it's it's like experiencing a book in a completely different way and while i love what you're saying about this is as much a portfolio of art as it is prose for like um hyperborea mm-hmm. okay wow boy i am just hi wow i'm doing great today um while I see that there, I it would never have occurred to me to be like, oh, this is pretty. I'm just going to buy it for the pictures. I'm like, no, this this goes together. You know, the the images invoke emotion, at least in me as a reader, yes. and the stories evoke more thoughts. Which actually, I'll jump back when you said about watching David Lynch uh, movies. I remember someone once asked me, "Do you like David Lynch films?" And I said, "I like the way my brain feels." when I'm at the end of a David Lynch film. I feel like I actually got to experience a film as opposed to the very surface films that I think are the majority right. of what is produced in America. In my opinion, you know, not, not slamming any one filmmaker, but I just feel like everything is very laid out for you. A fifth grader could follow it along. And I feel that David says, think a little bit harder. Think about what you're watching. Film is supposed to be a visual medium. And also, life doesn't happen in neat, little, linear right. moments. Now, we think, Jen, we're talking about life, of course, is linear. No, not really. Because, you know, I'm sitting here talking with you, but I'm also thinking about my son, and I'm thinking about my father, and I think, oh, you know, David reminds me of this and this, and oh my gosh, and right. I'm thinking about when I, as a reader, am reading Deo Collectrum as opposed to me as your interviewer or me as the publisher or something like that. And how those things come across completely differently. But okay, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to stick to the questions here. So on Speak, we ask artisans to weigh in on some of the same major issues that are going on in the creative industry. Mm-hmm. And one of the ones that I wanted you to talk to me about is there is this war that everyone seems to be hyping up, especially in the media and regional buyers, distributors, etc., where they say, you know, hey, you're either online bookstore, team online bookstore, or team brook, uh, bricks and mortar bookstores. How do you feel about the whole bricks and mortar versus online? And when you go to purchase a book to read, where do you buy? Good question. So I'll start with an example. Okay. And it's a book that was, um, it's called Forest of Eyes. It is by a Japanese poet named um, Chimako Tada. And I don't even know if it's actually in print anymore. I believe it is. But I'm bringing this up because it was tremendously influential on shaping Ada's voice. Um, This is a book that contains both prose poems and poetry. Mm -hmm. It's translated. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
I was walking, I was at Elliott Bay Books. It was up in the new location where they're up now on top of Capitol Hill. And I was over in the poetry section, and I'm not even sure what I was looking for. And I'm just kind of wandering around looking, and there turned out cover-wise is this book. It's blue, and it has this sort of peacock, oh, peacock feathered face, although it's hard to say what it really was. Hmm. And it just says The Forest of Eyes. And that title just was like, wow, what it, well, and I grabbed it, picked yeah. it up, and I've got two copies of it now because I have, it's one of those books I don't want to ever not have. Right. So um, it was amazing. And I never would have found that at Amazon. Amazon has some things that are helpful. I'll, I'll say there's illustration books mm-hmm. that I know I specifically have wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, that were figure drawing ones that were recommended that have ISBNs on them Mm -hmm. during the pandemic. Yep, I'm sure. I I ordered those from Jeff because I knew, there they are. I'll put in my order and it'll come. Um, On the other hand, there's other books that I know I could order through there that I just decide not to uh, because I like, I do like going to a bookstore. There's There's a new little bookstore up in Paulsbo uh, it's called Book at Nook, and um, the owner's very nice up there. And uh, I remember going up there with a Mishima title I wanted to buy. Yeah. And she could just look it up and yeah, ordered it for me. Now I probably paid a little bit more money for it, but I didn't need to read it right away because I already had a big stack of stuff in the way. Yeah. So th- two weeks later, because this book was out of print, it but winds she found it. it she you. found it yeah. and calls me up and says, hey, your book's here. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, there it is. I go up and there it is. So um, I think it depends on how you're going to be reading the book and how you are as a reader. Mm-hmm. If you are um, into, there's, there seems to be some types of genre fiction that are, is stronger online than it would be perhaps at a bookstore. Yeah. Um, and yet there's other things that you just have to get that synchronicity of being in the right place at the right time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that can happen at, at bookstores. Sure. I would, what I really miss at bookstores is readings. That was always one of my favorite ways of actually discovering people was mm-hmm. like being at Elliott Bay, for example, when I used to live in Seattle. Yeah. And I may just be there to buy a book or I was just stopping in because it was on my way to get art supplies at Blick or something. And all yeah. of a sudden, there's somebody reading downstairs. Oh, that sounds interesting. And I've made a new discovery. Again, that doesn't happen on Amazon. Right. Um, and they, I'm sure they're trying to work their darndest to get, you know, uh, and I don't even want to get into the meta thing of no, no, no. Mr. Zuckerberg, but no, no. Um, uh, you can still do that at a bookstore. And I would yeah. hope that when the pandemic stuff lifts off, more people can go for the experience of books in general. Because if you just want to read a book, yeah, you can get it on your Kindle Get, download it on Kindle, get on the airplane and fly off. I know that they can be very convenient that way. Yeah. Um, and uh, for, especially for some people who have, uh, you know, need accessibility accommodations. Sure. Sometimes that's the only way they can read books now. Yes. So that makes sense to me too. So it, there is, you're right. I think there's kind of a broad spectrum mm-hmm. of them. It's not an either or question. Mm-hmm. I would just hope to say that, you know, that they still exist that they move towards being community gathering places where people can gather in person and mm-hmm. celebrate words, no matter what kind of writing it is, whether yeah. it's sports writing or it could be recipes or sure. anything like that. No, or you're, fiction. you're absolutely right. I mean, I think even if Amazon launched some kind of uh, uh, something like Green Room, uh, where readers could, uh, an author could come, they could read, and people could, you know, then speak and ask questions live. I still think it would just be a completely different experience. Not to say I don't think they should do that. I think they should. But I love that you you keep using that word experience. Because to me, I equate the bookstores with movie theaters. Yeah. You know, they say, especially since the pandemic, folks are watching movies more and more at home. You know, folks said, well, I'm going to invest in a bigger TV. I'm going to invest in a good sound system. And then I'm not, you know, sitting in a seat that 5,000 other people have sat in. And I'm not dealing with someone else's sticky treats or, you know, whatever under my shoes. But I still get to see a movie. But there is something about the experience. Yeah. And I, some folks, you know, oh, that's ridiculous, you know. No, and I'm like, no. no, okay, fine. For you then, maybe, no. But I think for... 
folks that truly love books, for folks that truly love film, yes. I have to equate those two things. Going into a bookstore, because I, I gently, and going to a movie theater, I think are a similar experience for, that's a for very good, lovers of those mediums. I, that's a very good way of, of putting it, because I don't even know how many times now I've seen Barry London, yeah. but the two times I remember best was at Uptown and at their new cinema place over when um, they got a new screening theater at, uh, oh, it was near the Opera House. I can't remember what it's called, but yeah. it, it's one of Sif's screening rooms there. Yes. And very different seeing it there mm -hmm. on a big screen like that with a lot of people too, which is the huge thing. I remember yes. there's when somebody would tell me that, I'd say, we're going to a horror film because there's no way you can sit in a theater, mm -hmm. in a dark theater with 50 other people. Because sometimes it's not even as scary when you watch it again. Mm -hmm. Did this freak me out? The cemetery was like that. But when we were, God, when I saw that, with well, the first group of friends I was with, and we were all in the theater together, it was terrifying. Yeah. Especially when the oh, the sister gets up and kind of scuttles <laughs> over to the door. And we were all just freaked out at that. And then later, two years later, we watched it again. I'm like, what was it? It was that energy That's of right. being in the cinema. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. It's that uh, that being swept up in the communal experience. Uh, the communal intelligence, I believe, is what Robert McKee calls it when he talks about film theory. Um, you know, I always laugh and say, ah, you know, it's not, it's not psychological, it's pheromones. Everyone's fear pheromones. One of the best movie as I ever saw yeah. experiences like that was seeing, uh, it was again a SIF thing during Halloween. Yeah. And they, had, they were showing the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and they had a live one guy playing both violin and piano at the same time doing the score for it. Oh my god! And it was amazing. Um, that would be incredible. It was amazing to watch that. And people who have even seen the silent films yeah. at the Paramount where they're doing the organ things, they say, yeah, that's a completely different, you know, you're living in a very different world yes. once you go in there and they fire up that Wurlitzer and it's it Ooh. changes everything about it. So It reminds me of when I am looking at the rough cut of a film like from Blue Forge Films from our film studio and I'll see it to approve it to move forward and it's prior to the score. Oh. And wow. I have written some because you know, I'm supposed to fill out a report before it gets passed on to the composer. I have just been scathing before it. This is ridiculous. Why were these shots used? This actor needs to be called back in. I mean, I'm just like not a nice person. You know, it's all internal. And, you know, I mean, they expect it. They just want me to be brutally honest. And then the composer will, you know, send me back a note and be like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm looking at those sections. I'm not going to actually send this back to the editor. Let me just give you the pass with the music. Yeah. And it, it completely changes the experience. Yeah. Which, again, now I have to go back to the out collector. I'm like, that idea of... Music, prose, and and visuals, I think, is so incredibly arresting to me. As much, yeah, it's the one issue I was thinking of this, actually, of this this interview, especially because, again, I was watching. Um, it was, um, you know, it was. I, mean, I can't remember. It was a, actually it was a special on the internet about um, how Dave Brubeck's group made Take Five and um, that whole album. And I was thinking in terms of like with music, because the funny thing with music is, um, I, I wasn't, you can see this kind of in the earlier pieces of it, music got to be a much more important thing as I wrote, because I, one of the things in developing the character of Ada, I wanted her to have a different musical taste necessarily than I did. Mm. It forced me into listening to different music. Yeah. So. Um, one of the things that Ada, and I, had, I always say this is why she sounds like a real person often, got me into is Gustav Mahler. Because most of the classical music that I like was Bach and pre-Bach, um, uh, you know, what they sometimes call early music. Okay. Whereas Ada liked, you know, the, er, the latest, earliest composer she really likes is Chopin. Mm -hmm. And so... That's when I started listening to Chopin. I didn't really listen to Chopin until probably, oh, maybe 2014, 2015, when I was more writing more and more of her stuff and realizing that the, um, like the moods and everything that you would find in him fit her much better. Um, and then I'm, it was an easy way to jump from there to modal jazz because that was something else that she liked. And 
something else that she and and then they then these began to become parts of her stories so that when you read uh Sunrise, which is a book in, um, was one of the stories in, in Across the Desert of My Goats, Mahler shows up, and Mahler is very important. The Fifth Symphony of Mahler is very, very important because it provides a link between Ada and her uncle, and it helps out with the climax of the story, so I won't go into it. But um, I knew at that point it was very, and I, I and so it, it yeah. Music got to be very important, but I still sit there and I'll write that, and I wrote the whole ending to it, listening to that symphony. Yeah. And wishing somehow, oh, this is why people make movies, because I can't, I can't present all of this. Right. I can just suggest it, but I can't actually put it into yeah. there, which was just, ugh. and you just hope people will go and read it. But, but it turns out they do. Mm-hmm. And the way I know that is, is that uh, Haruki Murakami, who is one of my favorite all-time authors, mm-hmm. anybody who's read his stuff a lot knows he uses music a lot when he's describing things. <clears throat> and there's a scene in his novel called um, Kafka at the Shore where the two, char- two characters are in a car driving, talking about the Archduke Trio mm-hmm. by Beethoven. And if you go, if you Google... Uh, YouTube for Archduke Trio. Yeah. One of the first comments you often see is, is everybody else here because of Kafka on the Shore? Because we all want to know what it sounds like. Yeah. And so people will go and do that. And his novels always start off, it's the the Thieving Magpies, what starts off the Wind Up Bird Chronicle. For 1Q84, it is the, oh, it's a John of Czech piece. I can never remember the name of it. But then you'll go and you look, yeah, all these people, these obscure music, and then, yep, sure enough. Mm-hmm. They're going there because Murakami talked about it in his book, and so they want to go read about it. So you can get it a little bit, but not like you can do it in a film. And I the, the kind of, uh, again, that communal experience. It's kind of neat that we can get a little bit of that online. Because yeah. I know exactly what you mean. I'll look something up about a particular author, and there'll be people. And I think that's what I love about readings in person. And that is something I do yeah. miss about going to bookstores for events like that, is that idea of looking around going, all these people most likely love this book the way I do. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. That's they a... love this. They've come out of their homes. <laughs> They've maybe taken time off work. Taken time to just rearrange their schedule to sit here so that we can hear this author read a random chapter or, you know, whatever it is, just because it's like your work has changed my life. And I love that experience. Like, look at all these people that have been touched. Yeah. I remember the, the, the biggest, if, well, I, and that exact emotion I ever felt. Yeah. Was it a Seattle Arts and Lectures um, reading? It was over in Kane Hall in UW because it was so big yeah. for Louise Erdrick. And there was five, at least 500 people in line oh afterwards to get her to sign books. Oh, I'm sure. And <laughs> I was probably about maybe 150 down the row yeah. and got up to her. And she was as beautiful, as intelligent, and as gracious as her writing is. I was stunned. And you could tell she could handle the rest of the 450 that were behind me. And we were all there to, like, right. soak her up. Right, exactly. Like, to emote all yeah. over her. Yes, exactly. And it was a great thing to see. And that's, yeah. like, that's why that kind of, I think, thing is what can happen at bookstores. And yeah. why they can still exist. Yeah, I agree. I absolutely agree. There is something there that I'm just not sure. And actually, I'm a, I'm a huge champion of online services but primarily for the accessibility reasons that we're talking about. Um, Sometimes I feel there are certain books, there are certain publishers right now, especially out of New York, that are printing their books so small and so strangely spaced on such cheap paper that I would have to put reading glasses on my reading glasses with a spotlight and only read... You know, it at high noon. Right. But on a Kindle or some other kind of reading device, um, you know, it's no problem. I can change. There it is. Yeah, and I think that's really wonderful. But, okay, speaking of all those books that are being published, so I will say this statistic did shock me. Now, I know that it includes both books published by a publishing house, independent or corporate, and also books that are self-published. But in America alone, roughly 600,000 books... So a little over than half a million books published every year. That's a lot of books. And we could talk, I'm sure, for two or three hours about 
How do we get proper representation in a bricks and mortar store? How do we get proper representation in an online store? I, we're not even gonna touch on that. But what distinguishes you and your books? And actually, before you answer that, David, I do want to say, now, when I was growing up, in general, if I had to pigeonhole your work into a genre, it would be high lit. I, and again, you know, kid of the 90s, just saying. No, that's... So when you're talking to me now about, you know, what distinguishes you in your work, would you also tell me what genre in general, and if it's a different genre for each book, I'd like to hear that. What do you see it as? In general, I would say it's high lit because that's the world I came from. Okay. That's the that's the those that's the those are the words I was reading that made me want to be a writer. Yeah. So back when I was in, and yet there's none of you're not really going to see any of this in here. Mm -hmm. But when I was when I was in high school in advanced in, in you know advanced placement English classes, it was things like Gustave Flaubert mm -hmm. and it was William Faulkner especially. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, there was stuff about Faulkner that I, I I still treasure to this day about the way he could just spin these stories and then use language and I thought I want to do that I want to do mm -hmm. that and it that continued on as I got my English degree and then you know eventually getting to Joyce and some stuff like that where mm -hmm. just the ability to make that language sing and spark even in prose was something I wanted to do yeah. and that so that ultimately lurks behind a lot of it I think Mm -hmm. uh, even though kind of the first novel I really got published, which was that uh, Nightingale Stone, mm -hmm. is, you know, people would say, and I, I had this problem everywhere I, I went when I uh, first was kind of writing the manuscript for it. I talked to a couple of agents, uh, some of the booksellers at King's Books in Tacoma, yeah. also at Elliott Bay, and they said, I don't know. I don't know where I would shelve it. I don't know where it. I would shelve this. Mm -hmm. They said because there's aspects about this that are definitely, I think, oh, she's talking to troll, this has to be fantasy. Yeah. But I read this passage and I'm like, no, this has to go into literary, this has to go into literary section. Yeah. And that can feel like such a death sentence when, as authors, we hear that. I just don't know what and, to do with this. I don't know what to shelve it. And I, I realize the only way you can kind of forge forward is yeah. to just not worry about it. Agreed. And, um... So I just write, and that's the thing. You won't read a book. I, I will say what makes Deo Collectrum stand out, first of all, its name. Google it. There's only one Deo Collectrum in the universe. Oh, fantastic. And it's that book. There we go. <laughs> um, because I was, I had made that up. And I didn't, and just made it up, and then it sounded good. And then when I did check it on Google, I was like, oh, great. This is, is unique. It sound made up. And so it's, um, it's not shaped. And the other thing is, I will say because yet, and I, um, and maybe we get a chance to talk about this later. There was a break that I took from writing. Once I got my master of fine arts in writing, I took a break for a few years, mm -hmm. didn't write, and then came back and eventually started writing again. And the kind of the way How I long, got David? ten years, mm -hmm. about ten years. It's hard to say. It's kind of like you know sometimes when you break up with somebody, it, unless it's a really momentous, dramatic breakup where. Yeah. You just don't ever see them again. Usually you're like, well, was it March? Well, yeah, but except for that time, you know, later in April. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, human nature. It's kind of, writing's kind of like that, too. Yeah. You're like, no. But I can say, definitely, for about 10 years solid, I was not, and I was not writing in what I would say a writer's career mode, especially. Yes. Um, little dabbles or dreams and journals don't count. Mm -hmm. I can get to that later, but... Mm -hmm. Um, when I came back and started writing again, I was not at a, you know, what I like to call a MFA industrial complex program, mm -hmm. um, nor was I really writing genre fiction. I was writing something that was swimming in the middle of it, and I just decided to quit worrying about it. Okay. Um, and that was ultimately what it was. Not that, too. And the character herself did not want to be... I don't want to stay in 17th century alternative Germany. Mm -hmm. I want to check out Capitol Hill. <laughs> um, partly that's because I think of the way she looked and everything. She'll be a lot happier up there. But, um, and then all of a sudden that's what happened. And so the character herself started moving around mm -hmm. in different worlds. And so as a result, you get still a lot of different takes on things but if you if you do want literature that has a little bit of magic to it like you'll get with um 
magical realism. Mm -hmm. There's definitely pieces of magical realism that are in my stories, but it's not... Oh, I, I, I I sometimes sit in on a magical realism group on Facebook, and it's always interesting when people, they love to argue about that particular mm. genre. Um, is it, you know, did it's it originate from... It's a genre. It, well, for some, re, for some people it's not. <laughs> it's you it's know. like, it's the science fiction argument. Exactly. Yeah. And so it's just interesting, but I think, no, there's pieces of it that I have there, but there's other pieces that aren't. And so... I don't really worry about that, so that's why you can get the story that's very unique. You're not going to be able to read anywhere else mm -hmm. because I'm not coming from any particular approach other than my own. Yeah. So it's it's unique. So if it's something that was like, as I said, I love Louis, Louise Erdrich's novels um, about you know Native American experience, but in the Ojibwe and yeah. Anishinaabe and in um, the Dakotas. Most of those are fairly realistic. Mm -hmm. They have some alternative, what maybe some people would call magical realist, or they would call realism. Right. And it's... Yeah. I just love it. I love reading it, so I want to have some stuff that's like that. And I want to be able, be able to get a little bit of, of her sense of how you can build a family from these broken fragments together because, you know, some outside force like the U.S. government shattered it. Mm -hmm. Well, that sensibility can sometimes show up in here, too. Mm -hmm. um, just because I've read her stuff, but I've also read, you know... Um, uh, God, I still remember, like, one of the earliest books I remember is by Richard Wright. Um, we got to read um, pieces of Native Summer, I think, when we were, I was in second grade. And I always remember that, too. So there's this... Uh, I like being well read so that you'll see a lot of that come out. But there's nothing really in the books that I would say is overly political mm -hmm. or it has to be timely. Mm -hmm. And um, and I do, I'll, I'm not completely good with it because I try to stay, I try not to do a lot of pop culture references. It's virtually impossible to do that these days mm -hmm. uh, when you're writing. But I do also try to tone that down or hide it behind something. Mm. To where if yes. you if you can look at the hints, you're like, okay, I know what he's talking about. Right. But but it shouldn't actually. If you don't get like, there's one story in Deo Collectum where if you don't get that, that's Al Stewart and the Year of the Cat. Yeah. That's okay. Yes. You can just read it as a nice little memory of her childhood. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. We're not going to hit people over the head with the pop culture references, but it it is part of our lives. Yeah. There's going to be little things that we say or think about or do or laugh at or whatever it is. I think that's very, very fair. So we keep saying she and her. And, of course, who we're talking about is Ada. And I love that you brought up Capitol Hill. Now, for folks that don't know, uh, Capitol Hill in Seattle is kind of the, and has been as long as I can remember, kind of the heart of the avant-garde creative um queer community in Seattle. And Ada, who is the breakout star, the breakout magical realism, to me, Ada would be the, the fey queen of Capitol Hill. Uh, but not, not queen in the, in the way that it's normally used right now, but rather the ruler of. I think she would be the classiest thing to ever walk <laughs> any street in Seattle. Uh, David already knows I have a, a pretty substantial crush on Ada. And, I mean, that is something, because I don't crush. It's just not kind of something I do. I think that Ada is passionate. She is bold. She is conflicted. And you deal with a lot of themes yeah. with Ada. Big, universal themes that she carries on shoulders that are not terribly broad really, but a back that is very, very strong. Very strong. Um, one of them that you return to time and time again is sterility. Am I saying that right? Yeah. I am, I'm killing it. I think the <laughs> pressure, David. Um, which I think you have, at least in the Ada books, in the yeah. Ada World books, sometimes it, I feel like it's almost used as a metaphor, and sometimes I think it's used, you know, more literally, but you do come back to it. And also grief. Um, loss, love. Again, the big universal my life changed after that moment type elements. But instead of just asking you what does that mean? Why do you do this? I want you to just talk to me. You can answer that, but talk to me about Ada. Who is Ada? Why is she in so much of your work? 
and why is she important? In Capitol Hill, we always have to go back. We are always going to be going back to Capitol Hill. Okay. Because that's where we met. Um, Capitol Hill is where Richard Hugo House is located. It's a writing and arts center there that's uh, for people. It's gone through a lot of different permutations. But I was taking it. I was, after I had gotten out of my silence, which I had talked about a little bit earlier, Mm -hmm. a friend of mine said, why don't you go take some classes at Hugo House? And so I started taking classes at Hugo House just to get back into the act of writing and meet other people. So this is after earning your bachelor. This your is after earning ma- and sorry, and the masters and your masters. Yeah, I love that. So constantly learning. Um, I went back there and I was taking a prose poetry class, which I had never taken prose poetry classes even in um, the MFA school, and mm-hmm. it was a night class. I remember, and we were. I don't even remember what the actual prompt was. But this was in 2008. I st- I'll still know the cl- when it was. And I don't even remember what the prompt was, but I got this image of this very tall woman with long, dark hair. She was rather skinny. Um, her complexion's kind of the color of Brit- of good British tea when you've just put the milk in it. Mm. And she walks down this slope. It's a beautiful green grass, but it's a, a fairly high slope. Maybe it's in Switzerland. Maybe it's in Germany in the Alps somewhere. And she starts talking about her life. And she was a librarian, but then she got kicked out of that job and wound up being a notary for this mining company. And then she met this guy <laughs> who told, said all the right things. And you know, that's nothing but trouble. Yeah. And they wound up going off on this adventure and she's never shut up since. And so... Um, in a Hugo House... In a Hugo House writing class. class assignment. A class is where that originally happened. The evolution of that was one of the things to get that voice I knew. And this was finally something where I was like, okay, when you're a writer and you know, like, a lot of write, beginning writers struggle with, like, what's my voice? Yeah. Um, which can be, like, what's the just weird tick that gets you into being able to write without having to worry about writer's block or anything like that? Yeah. Ada was that for me. And so I... Um, Started, you know, started kind of writing some stories and working with the writing, found a writing collective of nine different people, and we all got got together and we started producing zines, mm-hmm. and some of these were little prose poems that, it, you know, Ada would write, mm-hmm. um, and so uh, we were doing that, and at the same time, I was going to a lot of poetry, a lot of poetry readings and a lot of book readings, both at, a, at anywhere basically I could. Yeah. When women were reading specifically, and. Um, it was just a way of, like, you just kind of absorb that voice. And mm-hmm. there was one particular one I remember, and I still have the program for it. I found it the other day when it was cleaning out in 2011. Uh, it was 10 years ago. Uh, there was a writing, it was a group of women called, uh, they got together and did this show called She Said. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't remember off the top of my head everybody. David Schmader, I remember, he used to write for The Stranger. Mm-hmm. He was hosting it. But the whole program was women. And the second to last, I think, Corbin Lures was one of them, but the other woman that was there who I'd never heard of before was a poet named Elizabeth Austin. And she gets up to the stage. First of all, at that time, she had Ada's haircut, which was, I thought, kind of funny. Hmm. Uh, because the haircut is very ancient. Uh, and she gets up there, and, and this amazing contralto voice, and I later learned was Shakespearean trained, um, actor oh, comes wow. out and it's like that's it, that's the voice I've heard. That's yeah. the voice that I hear in my head yeah. when these words start coming. And that was in 2011. That was in 2011. And you had been writing Ada since 2008. Two, 2008. And then finally it clicked in with this and like that's what she sounds like. Yeah. And I could finally hear this. Um, and that kind of pushed her more towards. But we finally got. I said we, and so that's all in first. Almost all of these are in first person. Mm-hmm. It's always her perspective, but mm-hmm. she's kind of grown as as things have come along. Mm-hmm. And originally, when um, and there was a couple of short stories that are also in Collecting Shadows. One thing I'll say about this is it takes place in the same world, the same alternate seventeenth century Germany that Nightingale Stone does. Mm-hmm. But that's kind of where the break occurs, is that after that, she started wanting to be more out in this world. Mm-hmm. And so, um, Hyperborea was the next one where you really get that, where that's where the transition happened. Where okay. she then starts, you know, uh, 
there's a piece where, you know, you know she starts, she's in Capitol Hill. Or uh, one of my favorite ones where she's driving on to the uh, Bainbridge Ferry yeah. and finds a compact in her boyfriend's car glove box that's not hers. Mm. And that's when it finally clicks like, oh, he's sleeping with somebody else. Yeah. And then um, that was a very much of a modern day story and she had to kind of think about that. But getting back to some of the themes of that, Somewhere along the road, and I this this I I think this is important because I I'm not and I won't go into this too much, but I'll just say I don't have children at mm-hmm. the, this point. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can have them or not. There's no big testing done or anything mm-hmm. like that. But a uh, one of my uh, I do know of somebody basically who is not able to have children. Yeah, because of some. Oh, wild times in their 20s. Mm-hmm. And um, it's explained more in the book, so I'll just let them find sure. it there. Yeah. And one of the other things I thought about that happened kind of all this around 2011 when I'm hearing this, especially different women's voices about motherhood, and especially some of the poets were like, you know, I'm not a mom. Does that mean I'm not a real woman? And, mm-hmm. you know, there was a lot of questions. It's just, those are the mm-hmm. questions that they would bring up in order to answer that with their poetry. Yeah. At the same time, there was this young senator from Illinois who I admired very much, who went on to unprecedented victory and became the president of the United States. And I remember something very vividly that he said was, I, you know, with the presidency and everything like that is great, but I'm most proud of being a good father. Mm-hmm. And... Barack Obama said that, it just crushed me because I thought... Is that what I'm missing? Is that what I'm missing? I'm not sure I'm ever going to or can. I don't know. Yeah. Does that make me an incomplete? And I thought, and how much worse must that be with all the pressure that you women have Hmm. in terms of, oh, it's great to be a mother, but I don't want to be defined by that. Yeah. And this constant dialectic that's going on with that Mm -hmm. in addition to societal pressures about it and it just kind of made it seem very very real to me and I knew at that point that that's when like basically Ada was going to be sterile Mm -hmm. and like what is she going to do with the rest of her life now as a meaning for it and we've been exploring that since 2013 when the Mighty Gale Stone came out up until now because she ages with me, mm-hmm. so I'm 51 now, so mm-hmm. Ada's 51. Mm-hmm. You know what that means. She's entering another part of her life. Yes, she is. <laughs> and so she has <laughs> joked about this being in the collector and is saying, ah, but this is when, you know, all women become like me through the venereal disease we call life. You catch it when you're born. Yeah. And, um, and it, it, that piece of it, but it gives her her freedom. Mm-hmm. Because now she doesn't have to be defined in terms of that. Right. She can choose what her own destiny is. Yes. And it was, uh, and that insight helped a lot because I had been reading my own, my own male midlife crisis. I found Albert Camus mm-hmm. was extremely helpful. This was even before the pandemic. Yeah. Which by, I, by chance I read The Plague right before that actually broke out, which was interesting because mm. I was like, oh. I got to see all of that happen. I'm like, oh, this is exactly what Kevin was talking about. Yeah. Um, but I read The Myth of Sisyphus, which shows up in that book over and over and over again. And I, one thing that I realized, that kind of thinking through this, is that um, Ada will say specifically, there's a one in there called The Approach, that there is a point where you keep pushing the rock up the hill and it rolls down. Mm-hmm. But the one there's one point when women have where you can push the rock up the hill... And when you hit menopause, it'll roll down the other side of the hill. Hmm. And you may be pushing it up, but you're not pushing it up the same hill anymore. You may hmm. be pushing it up a different hill. And that's the one thing, because Camus wrote so much of that from his own masculine French perspective, mm-hmm. that I just got this sense that he was missing that piece of it. Now, I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a woman, but that's what I thought Ada would say, yeah. is that... I love you, Albert, but you're not getting the whole picture. Yes. Because you're leaving out half of humanity. And what's it like for a woman to have to push the rock up the hill? Because we do it all the time. Right. And I 
I mean, I, I appreciate and I value, you know, when, and you have always been very fast when you and I have spoken before to say, look, I'm not a woman, but, you know, th- I'm, from A to S, this is the best that I get, this is from my perspective. But I think that I always see your writing about Ada in one of two ways. Either this is your female aspect in that way that we all have a feminine and a masculine. And in some ways she challenges you and is almost like um, your twin sister who's yeah. always calling you on your stuff. You know, like, no, Dick, think about it this way. No, think about it this Older way. Older twin sister. Yes. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> or, exactly, that this is an older sister or... Um, a, an older female friend who's been in your life, your entire life, who has, and I'm saying that, you know, a very, very, very long-term lifetime friend or sibling because of that, that intimacy, that connection, never do I feel this is unauthentic. And so Ada and I are, well, just like you and I, David, yeah. if I'm 47, we're very, very close in age. And Ada facing menopause and Ada in menopause to me is one of the most fantastic moments of me as a reader because I had no idea that my life was going to change so fantastically and it's funny because I bore two children so I wasn't carrying that particular issue forward but there is a freedom that I did not realize was going to suddenly be awarded me as someone who is now no longer expected to have more. Yeah. And I think people forget that they they think that it's it's not just you, David, now someone's like, well, are you ever gonna have kids? Are you ever gonna have kids? You know, whether it's a man or a woman, are you ever gonna have kids? It's, it doesn't happen to people who don't, it doesn't only happen to people who don't have children. Even if you already have children, it's, are you gonna have another? You seem to really like it. And I'm like, my <laughs> gracious. My gracious, that is not all that I am. Um, Okay, so the books that we have up on the shelf, except for the collection, though there is some Ada there, but there's also some here. This is Unnerving Volume 1, Unnerving Volume 2, Unnerving Volume 3, and the Mighty Pen Anthology. Those are all um, anthologies, collected stories by lots of different authors. You're in all of them. Does Ada appear in any of those? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, Mighty Pen is one that's a good collector's item because that's the story that describes how she got kicked out of grad school. Oh, okay. Um, and that also kind of leads to where... So it, it, it describes that. It's alluded to... If there's a, there's a story in Cross the My Ghost called American and Ballard. Mm-hmm. And it's when she's in her early 20s and, and they reference grad school and they reference the incident... Well, the incident is described in there. And that was really interesting because I knew it was about that. And then it went on a totally different direction than I thought it would by virtue of the prompt. Hmm. And then there's this typewriter that she has possession of and and who she gets it from and who she eventually gives it to Mm -hmm. that's very, very important that I really didn't even see it coming when I was writing it. But then Hmm. it's like, oh, no, that makes sense. Uh, the, uh, for those of you that haven't picked up a copy of The Mighty Pen, The Mighty Pen is, when Dave was talking about the prompts, it's not that it was the Trinity Project, it's that the, the prompts in The Mighty Pen were this idea of a writing implement. Intrigue, the yeah. story had to involve some kind of writing implement, whether it was a, a quill or um, clay paint on a wall or a right. typewriter or et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry. And then I think in um, uh, Unnerving One, mm-hmm. the Ada's in that because that's an old story of when she uh, was little and they go to, because they, they speak, they, they mention her name in that, mm-hmm. where <clears throat> <clears throat> this was based off a of memory of my own. Not quite the way she had it. Mm-hmm. She steals a lot of my youth, you know, but this was one that she kind of cooked up herself, but... There was a going home from a drive-in movie that her uncle had taken her to with this a date that her uncle was on, mm-hmm. and she was sort of in the back seat. Now, back in the old days, that's kind of how you could do movies. You could actually go in a car and in your pajamas as a kid, and you'd watch the film, and the adults would hope that you could go to sleep in the first feature so they could make out during the second one. <laughs> 
And that's kind of what happened, but they start driving back, and they're driving back through Rancho Cordova and Sacramento, and the music that's on the radio is, um, <laughs> music again, is uh, Hotel California by the Eagles. Okay. Now, when I was a kid, that movie, that I was about six or seven that that came out, that mm-hmm. song came out, mm-hmm. and I remember, I grew up in California, there was a point when we were driving back from my grandparents' house in Arizona across the Mojave, and we were driving across the desert dark desert highway at night and that song came on and I was terrified we were going there because there was that woman there that you couldn't leave right and they had that beast that you actually had to stab it to death to, to eat it and all the stuff that's going on I take all of that literally as a right. six year old like where in the hell is dad taking us right are we going to the hotel California and it terrified me for oh, years no. oh. eventually I get older and I kind of can laugh at it now and I thought well I she's got to take that story yes except she goes there mm. and so she's able to go to the Hotel California mm. and really it's not too bad but it's unnerving and it's creepy and one of the things I thought about was having it end with her you know talking to her uncle mm-hmm. this way and saying like oh and he says oh no wonder you were always you know you always hated the Eagles yeah. Um, she, she doesn't put it quite that way. I think she quotes the Big Lebowski about the, her her view of the Eagles. And um, but then I realized a friend of mine uh, on the ferry said, "No, you got to end it before she leaves the house, so nobody knows what happens." And so I trimmed off the end of the story, and I was, "It's perfect." That whole mm-hmm. epilogue ruined it, and that didn't ruin it. It was okay, mm-hmm. but it took out a lot of the gas of it. Where she's just in there, and you welcome to the hotel, California. You right. can't ever leave. And that's it. And so um, that was great. And then the other two stories in unnerving are not Ada stories, actually. There's one in the new one that came, comes out that you're just not ever sure. Yeah. Okay. There's a hint at, because she's never the narrator is never named. It's a first-person narrator. The only hint you get at it is at one point the little boy says, you have hair like my, uh, you have hair like my mom. And... Although she's not really my mom, but she's kind of my mom. And then later on in the story, because this this was actually based off of a dream that I had. Later mm-hmm. on in the story, you realize that the woman who's coming to pick up this little boy is Betty Page. Mm-hmm. And she was, in the dream, in my dream, she was dressed in this beautiful blue business suit that the kind of a woman would wear in the 50s. Mm-hmm. But she still had that, she still had the bangs and the long dark hair and mm-hmm. everything. And that's really the only hint you get. That it could be Ada, but maybe not. It's kind of not like canonical. It's not. It's a potential Ada. It's and this is where it, and I can now say where it because we've already talked about David Lynch a little bit. Yeah. He does the same thing, and that's where mm-hmm. I got the idea from. Where it's like that woman across the hall in a racer head is the same person who is Laura Herring, who is the same person as Tammy Preston, who is yes. the same person as Donna Valens in Blue Velvet. There's that dark-haired archetype that mm-hmm. shows up in every one of his mm-hmm. important films. Mm-hmm. Are they the same woman? Are they different? I can see a lot of people getting into continuity arguments and conspiracy theories about and Blue sure. Twin Peaks. Was that Audrey Horne? Yeah. And another doesn't matter because that's the archetype that comes out of David's yeah. subconscious. Yeah. Don't deconstruct David Lynch. Just so he's, let him be. Well, it's because uh, to me it just makes sense. That, no, that's the archetype that's in his right. subconscious. Right, exactly. Yes. And so it's a similar sort of thing mm-hmm. because, um, I mean, when I go way back to like where proto Adas came from, mm-hmm. um, the earliest memory I have is of Nancy Kovac in Star Trek. Oh, okay. Yeah. So... Mm. Where I can see, like, oh, yeah, there's... Yeah. And, and then when I watched that show again, it was like, oh, my God, that's where she came from. And she had to linger there from, again, when I was about six or seven years yeah. old until later on, uh, it's like, oh, that's where she came from, mm-hmm. ultimately. Because when I fr- finally saw her picture again when I, was wa- I watched that episode again, I realized, like, oh, my God, that's Ada. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where she came from. You already talked about this. You talked about walking into Elliott Books and opening a book. Also, for those who shop entirely online, there is that feature at Amazon, The Look Inside. So, you are going to read us a single page from okay. one of your books. And you've selected something. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be from Deo Collectrum. Yes. Okay. And... Uh, 
this, I always say, you know, it's, it's funny, I, I, I make my little notes here about, you know, something that epitomizes or is an, an entry to, but actually, I, I think we've already covered that. I feel the gateway drug to David Mecklenburg is you need to read these two books, Dea Collectrum and Across the Deserts of My Ghost, in tandem, and yeah. then move on from there. Oh, yeah. And because what you'll find, I'll just mention briefly, what you'll yeah. find in that both of these, because yeah. I still find it when I, when I reread it, it, there's a lot of stuff that still starts there. Yeah. Um, that is still, the voice is always the same. Um, what she's usually concerned about is always the same. Yeah. It's just the world that she's inhabiting is a little different. If you're fascinated about this woman, I mean, you can, you can, it, then yeah, begin with the Nightingale Stone. But you know, yeah, no, I'm sorry. There is something about reading a piece of work in the way it was written that I think is very unique and fascinating there. All right, so David, I'm going to shut up and you can take it away. Okay, so this is one page. This is a little bit, I'm not actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick to the rule. Okay. Uh, there is a little bit of the, there's a little bit of this that goes before, but when I read it through mm -hmm. to prepare for this, I realized it works just fine. All right. <clears throat> the last step was the breath of life, and this was always a difficult, cagey thing. Not that it was hard for her. Remember, she sprang fully armored from the mind of God and didn't need anyone to tell her anything about Dad's secret names. It was, get caught, it was getting caught doing it, bringing down the wrath of hubris, which was for the gods to meet out, not to inflict upon one another. But that sometimes happened, and her uncle's punishment of having his liver served up every day, Berliner out to an eagle, well, that didn't seem to figure well. But crap, she was making just one. A companion, not a race. But it didn't even matter. When Helios descended to find Zeus, in the rather odd shape of a glorified goose fucking a human woman, Helios shook his head and whispered in his ear, Your daughter is making a golem. Oh, let her. She needs a friend, maybe even a lover. The girl is so serious. Helios blew away the feather that fell near his face, igniting it instantly, and looked at the thunderer honking away and decided there was really little point in pursuing it further. And so she took the last of the coffee, a miracle so potent she would later hide it in Ethiopia, for it was as holy to her as wine was to that loutish little brother of hers, into the mouth of her golem, and then wrote the holy words upon a soft lozenge of wax. Ordinarily the word went on the forehead, but she was feeling a bit rebellious, and also turned on by her creation, so she kissed it into the lips of the golem, who first convulsed into life through a little death. And the golem came into the world, filled with love for all the new things she could experience, and gratitude for her mistress, most especially, for she had given the golem the gifts of love and beauty. But wisdom, which was her special provenance, would have to be wrested from her. Bright eyes looked forward to this part, for she knew it meant a dialectic of blood and poetry. David, thank you for coming and talking with us today. Sure. I think that was absolutely fantastic. That was a great choice. I don't think we consider enough the power of modern day parables. Those stories that are multi-layered and that explore the morals and truths of our lives. We tend to think about someone else's definition of canonical or classic to when we're looking for what is worthwhile or transformative. You know, is it Rand, Hemingway, Winterson, Mecklenburg? Everyone is different and different authors speak to different people, but words have power and they will leave their mark if they find the right listener, the right reader. I think ultimately, we all have to find our own classic writers, our own canonical writers, the foundation that we are like, this is what literature is all about. This is what story is all about. This is what spoke to me. Thank you for joining us today for Speak. Speak was brought to you by the 501c3 nonprofit Blue Legacy and made possible in part by grants from the Washington Arts Commission and the National Endowment for the Arts. If you'd like to be interviewed on Speak and you live in Washington State or you're safe to travel to Washington State, 
or if you have a question that you would like us to ask a future guest, please write to blueforgefilms at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you.